this semester in chapel, we'll be looking in a very broad way at the character of a minister, a spirit-engendered, spirit-nurtured qualities that suit a man to gospel service. And today we begin in Ezekiel chapter 1 a chapter in which we see something of the God who calls men into his service. And here in Ezekiel 1, we see language straining to describe, straining to hold the weight of a glory that the human mind is unable fully to comprehend. In verse 1, we read this marvelous declaration that the prophet Ezekiel saw visions of God. And then we read of that vision. This is the vision of God that ushered Ezekiel into his ministry as a prophet. Ezekiel saw the glory of God. And in our passage this morning, the prophet struggles to describe that majesty. Now the description that he gives is mesmerizing. Now when the prophet Ezekiel received this vision that began his service as a prophet... He was in a very particular place at a very particular time. At this point, the kingdom of Judah, the people of God, had been defeated by the Babylonian Empire. Some of those defeated Israelites had been carried into exile in Babylon, Ezekiel being among that group, while some of the Israelites remained in Jerusalem. Uh, The temple had been looted and stripped. The true king had been replaced. But nevertheless, some Jews yet still remained in Jerusalem with the king, with the temple. Ezekiel, being among the exiles, had none of those things. He'd been carried away from God's presence, away from the temple, into this desolating isolation of exile. And according to verse 2, it had been that way for five years. Five years in the wasteland of exile. And then, according to verse 1, the heavens split and Ezekiel saw visions of God. He saw what we read of in our passage this morning. And this vision that he had, it would set the course for the coming decades of his prophetic ministry. And the vision given to Ezekiel, recorded for us, we see that the inexpressibly glorious God of Israel is bringing judgment and showing mercy in all the earth. Now running throughout this vision, there's the unavoidable certainty that we're reading here of the inexpressibly glorious God of Israel. That reality peppers every verse of the passage, leading all the way up to Ezekiel's declaration in verse 28, that this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Now we don't have the time to read the entire passage again, but you recall, I would imagine from our reading of the text just a moment ago, that a certain refrain developed and persisted throughout the entire passage. Again and again and again, with an almost rhythmic repetition, Ezekiel writes that he saw the likeness of something, or that something had the appearance of something, or that something was like something else. Eighteen times in these verses, Ezekiel writes that something was like something else. Ten times he writes that something was in the likeness of something else. Ezekiel seemingly never tells us straight and simple that he saw this. He always tells us that he saw something that was the likeness of this. Ezekiel is straining to describe something for which there are no words. In English translation, understandably, Ezekiel's sentences are smoothed out. They read pretty evenly. But in the Hebrew language in which they originally were written, the writing in this chapter is incredibly erratic. It is the frenetic scrawling of a man who's almost undone by what he's seen. He's sputtering to wrap in words a vision that his eyes couldn't comprehend. There literally are not words to describe the glory that Ezekiel sees before him. This 
inadequacy of words reaches its apex in verses 24 through 28. We said a minute ago that in the passage, Ezekiel says 18 times that something was like something else. Well, nine of those times come in verses 24 through 28 alone. Here, the poverty of words is overwhelming. You know, these words are inspired. They're precisely the words that the Spirit carried Ezekiel along to write. But the glory that they describe transcends them. As you move from the beginning of the passage to the end of the passage, it's as if Ezekiel is describing his vision from the bottom up to the top. He begins in verse 5 with a vivid description of four creatures. Then he says in verse 22 that above those four creatures there was a firmament, an expanse, a separating layer, the color of crystal. And above that expanse, as we read in verse 26, Ezekiel saw the likeness of a throne. And on that likeness of a throne, Ezekiel writes in verse 26 that he saw the likeness as the appearance of a man. And that man from his waist up, from his waist down, all of that man was as flaming fire. And it's there in that man whose very being was the fire of holiness, it was there that Ezekiel saw, according to verse 28, the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. The prophet is heaping up qualifiers, making clear that he's unable fully to describe a vision, that he's unable fully to comprehend, but there he's seeing the glory of God the sense exploding overflow of the presence of Almighty God. As much as he possibly could, Ezekiel is seeing the glory of the God of Israel. And words fail him. Now on the one hand, that tells us something incredibly important from the outset about how to interpret, how to understand the words of this vision. You know, there's a tendency among some, you know, with this prophecy, with uh, other prophecies, there can be a tendency to dissect every single word, every detailed description of every minute detail of a very complex vision, and then read tremendous detail into those details. Now, at times, details do have specific meanings, and the scriptures often tell us what those are. But oftentimes, the purpose of the detail is to outline the incomprehensible glory of the whole. And that's the case here. The words of Ezekiel 1 are painting a rapturous picture. And it's that overwhelming whole that ought to be our concern. The overall ineffable weight of Ezekiel's graspings to describe the indescribable. Now, on the other hand... The indescribable nature of the vision that Ezekiel receives, it serves to heighten, to intensify the grace of that vision. Just think about the paradox that bristles throughout the entire passage. This is the God whose glory cannot be described, whose presence cannot be comprehended. And yet he has come down and he is revealing himself to his servant. This unknowable God is making himself known. The unseeable God is allowing his glory to be glimpsed. Before Ezekiel's swelling eyes, the infinite God appears in the likeness of a man sitting on the likeness of a resplendent throne. The God upon whom Ezekiel looks is a God of inexpressible glory. But he's also the God of Israel. And he makes himself known to his people. He comes to a people whose minds are incapable of conceiving of his majesty and his purity. Through these sputterings of the prophet who stands inadequate in the enveloping glory of God, we glimpse the inexpressible glory of the God of Israel. The God who is beyond our knowing, yet who makes himself known to his people. 
Now, as of yet, we haven't dealt with a great deal of the confusing details of the passage. The four-faced creatures, the wheels within wheels. We'll come to all of that soon enough. But before, we simply can't miss this central undergirding reality. The God who dwells in blinding light. The God who cannot be seen by sinful men. That God is making himself known. Ezekiel can't fully record this revelation of God. Uh, God is revealing himself in this indescribable majesty. And yet God is revealing himself. And as he does so, as God makes himself known to his people, even in our passage this morning, it is God the Son whom we see. The God whose appearing is too overwhelming for Ezekiel to capture is none other than Jesus Christ before he came in the flesh. In the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, when Jesus appears in his glory to James, Peter, and John, in Acts chapter 9, when the glorified Christ appears to Saul on the road to Damascus, in Revelation 1, when the glorified Christ appears to the apostle John, or in places like Mark 13, when Jesus described what it will be like when he returns at the end of the age, in all of these places we read something of the resplendent glory of what Jesus is like. And in all of these places, Jesus is described with the same sputterings that Ezekiel records here. The God whom Ezekiel saw as the likeness as the appearance of a man came as a man, born of a virgin, to redeem his people. Today, we so easily domesticate Jesus. We mistake his meekness and his gentleness and his patience. We mistake it for weakness. Now, brothers and sisters, you must allow the vision of Ezekiel to open your eyes to the glory of the invisible God who makes himself visible the overwhelming God of all glory who comes and reveals himself amongst his people. The apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 that in the Lord Jesus we behold the glory of God. We behold in Jesus a glory that made Ezekiel stammer and grope for words. This is the God of Israel. The God who lowers himself to be known among a people who cannot comprehend his glory. Now the vision that Ezekiel receives of this God, it's overwhelming. But Ezekiel doesn't only behold the glory of God. In his vision, Ezekiel also sees something of what God is doing. As we find in our passage the inexpressibly glorious God of Israel is bringing judgment and showing mercy. You look especially at verse 4 and then down at verse 28. At first in verse 4, <clears throat> we read this. And I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. And then down in verse 28, <clears throat> As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. In verse 4, When the skies just have been pulled apart and Ezekiel receives the first glimpses of this divine vision, it appears as if a storm is bearing down upon him. Ezekiel speaks of a whirlwind, a great cloud that pulsates and throbs with fire. Ezekiel there is describing fairly common prophetic indicators of judgment. Places like Psalm 18 verses 9 through 14 Nahum chapter 1 verse 3, and we see the imagery of God riding on the storm being used to picture a looming and an approaching judgment. And as we'll consider more closely in a minute, as Ezekiel's vision unfolds, 
He describes the approaching manifestation of God as riding on wheels, presenting the approaching God as coming on a chariot. God is a warrior, stalking to judgment within the clouds of the storm in his wake. Now very ominously, as Ezekiel tells us in verse 4, this divine storm is bearing down on him from the north. Historically speaking, when the people of Israel had been attacked, when they'd been beset by warring peoples, those peoples always had come from the north. Through his prophets, God had made very clear that he was using the armies of Assyria as the instrument of his judgment against the northern, king, uh, northern kingdom of Israel. And the Assyrian army leveled Israel in judgment, overrunning them from the north. And in the coming years, when the Babylonian army that already controlled Jerusalem would overwhelm her walls in destruction, that destroying army would attack Jerusalem from the north. Indeed, in warning his people of this coming judgment through Jeremiah in the days before Ezekiel's prophecy, God had said in Jeremiah 4 verse 6, I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. Both historically and prophetically, the north was the origin of great sufferings for the people of Israel. So to see a storm of judgment approaching from the north did not foretell good things. It spoke of coming affliction for the people of God. An affliction that promised to come from the hand of the God who rode upon the clouds. Throughout the intensifying complex vision that Ezekiel describes in our passage, this storm of judgment is always only just in the background. Everywhere there's the air of judgment. If you were to read on into chapter 2, you read of what God says to Ezekiel uh, after this vision. And in that speaking, God details the judgment that will come. And what we find in chapter 2 is God describes the judgment, verifies what seems almost unthinkable here. God is coming in judgment to judge the men of Israel. Those who are in exile will know continued affliction. Those who are in Jerusalem will witness the desolation of the temple, the entire city in a matter of years. God is bringing judgment and he's bringing it from the north, bringing it against the sons of Israel. As we found repeatedly in the Old Testament scriptures, within the nation of Israel, the ethnic people of Israel, there were some who were truly God's people, who were part of the true Israel, people like Ezekiel. And there also were people who were not of God's spiritual people. As Paul comments in Romans 9 verse 6, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And against those who are not truly his people, against those who are physically descended from Abraham, but who don't share his faith, against those people, God is bringing this desolating judgment. But then, at the very close of the chapter, in verse 28, Ezekiel sees, and then he offers God's people a shimmering of hope. As Ezekiel is describing the indescribable likeness of the glory of God, the appearance of the one who sits upon the sapphire throne, he says that in the appearance of that flaming king, he sees something, verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. This is a rainbow. We know what a rainbow is. It's a sign of God's covenant with Noah. God's promise that he will not destroy the world in judgment until he has gathered in all of his people. As the storm of judgment approaches, nestled at the very heart of that judgment is this God-ordained reminder that there is mercy and there is faithfulness amidst the storm. The God who comes in judgment is the God who has sworn that he will gather in all of his people. You know, strikingly, the same imagery appears in Revelation 4, verse 3. There, the apostle John is describing the throne room of heaven. 
And he tells us that there was one sitting on the throne. And around that throne, there was an encircling rainbow. There, as here, there is the tangible, visible guarantee to the people of God as they see the coming judgment. There is the visible guarantee that the Son of God who comes in judgment is the same God who has promised that His people are His. And even in the midst of judgment, they will know covering. And they will know mercy. That's the assurance that God holds out to Ezekiel in our passage. He makes clear in the thunderings of the storm that He's coming. And that the judgment is coming with Him. But He makes equally clear in the glistening of the rainbow that in the midst of the judgment that upends the wicked, there is mercy for those who are His. The inexpressibly glorious God of Israel is bringing judgment and showing mercy. In fact, as Ezekiel's vision makes so vividly clear, he's doing this in all the earth. Now again, we don't have the time to read the fullness of the description again, but perhaps you remember in verses 5 through 14, Ezekiel had described four living creatures. And those creatures seem bizarre amalgamations of various forms of life. You know, according to what Ezekiel tells us in verse 5, they each had the likeness of a man. Their general form looked like a man. But according to verse 6, they each had four faces and four wings. Down in verse 10, we find that these four faces are the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Now, generally speaking, each of these creatures represents regal creatures. The lion was considered the king of the beasts. The ox was considered the most important of domestic animals. The eagle was the king of the air. These are regal creatures. And these regal creatures with their wings are bearing up the firmament upon which sits the throne of God. Between verse 11 and verses 22 and 23 we find that of these four wings, each creature used two to cover his body, while the other two were stretched out, touching the wings of the next creature, and upon those touching wings sat the firmament upon which the throne rested. The imagery here is filled with the imagery of the presence of God. As you all know, the mercy seat which was the cover to the Ark of the Covenant, was topped by two seraphim, their wings stretched out, touching to form God's throne in the midst of His people Israel. Here, these conjoined wings again point to the presence of the Almighty. But note particularly at this point, not what is above the living creatures, but what is below them. Beginning in verse 15, <clears throat> Ezekiel tells us that beside each living creature there was a wheel, and a wheel of extraordinary complexity. You know, at the end of verse 16, Ezekiel describes them as being a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Wheels in wheels. Now at this point, with four creatures, each with four faces, each joined in some way to wheels within wheels, things potentially seem a little confusing. But the overriding point in all of this is complete and absolute freedom in movement. Now look at verse 12. There Ezekiel is describing these four-faced creatures and he writes, And they went every one straight forward. Whither the Spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. With four faces one perpetually facing each direction, the living creatures could instantly move in any direction without any ceasing to their motion. They wouldn't have to stop or slow to turn. They could go in any direction. The same is true of the wheels within wheels. Look at verse 17. Ezekiel writes of the wheels, When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. These wheels, just like the living creatures, are completely unhindered in their agility, their mobility. They can go anywhere at any time and can change their direction instantly. In all of this agility, 
the creatures and the wheels are utterly responsive to the leading and the moving of God himself. Verses 19-21, through Ezekiel describes how these living creatures and these wheels, all working and joined in tandem, how they're able to respond instantly and precisely to the will of the Spirit, the will of God's own Spirit. These living creatures, these wheels within wheels, together bearing up the expanse that supports the sapphire throne upon which sits the flaming likeness of a man. They make manifest the mobility of God. Or to put it more precisely, the omnipresence of God. The God who is not statically located in one place, but who is in all the earth, nowhere beyond the reach of his throne. The entire vision, if you got this sense as we read it a few minutes ago, it pulsates with motion. You don't have the time to do it now, but if you were to glance back and read Isaiah chapter 6, you read there of the vision that the prophet Isaiah received of God on his throne. And the vision that Isaiah received is grand and it's regal and it's fixed. God is on his throne in his temple. In the vision of Ezekiel, God moves. He hasn't left his throne. He hasn't set aside his dignity. He sits on his throne, and that throne moves and acts and reigns in all the world. And we can't forget how unbelievable it would have been, even to Ezekiel himself, that this vision was even taking place. Ezekiel, if you remember, was in exile. He was in Babylon. And everyone knew that God dwelt particularly in Jerusalem. Certainly if any man had any hope of receiving a vision as glorious as this, certainly that vision would come only in the temple or in the temple precincts because that is where God particularly dwelt. And so he could be seen in such sublime ways there. But here, the God of Israel sitting atop his eternal radiant throne, he's come to Babylon. He is there, and he's bringing judgment there, and he's bringing mercy there. God isn't confined. The walls of the temple weren't his prison. And for that matter, nearness to the temple didn't guarantee nearness to God. As you see throughout Ezekiel, the Jews who remained in Jerusalem were pagans. And they thought that physical proximity to the temple saved them. They thought the temple was what mattered they missed what Ezekiel saw. That God isn't bound by the temple. He moves. He reigns in all the earth. The Jews who were still in Jerusalem thought that their proximity to the temple meant that God favored them and had rejected those who had been led into exile. But God makes overwhelmingly clear here that physical nearness to the temple means nothing. The temple, the trappings, They're not some sort of rabbit's foot or amulet. God can't be pinned down in or by the temple. He rules in all the earth. He's the God of Israel who moves. The inexpressibly glorious God of Israel is bringing judgment and showing mercy in all the earth. But what does that have to do with the character of a minister? How does this equip and shape you for pastoral ministry? If you remember back that far, I implied that it did at the beginning of our time. But how is that so? Brothers, this is the God who is calling you. And this is the God who is sending you into fields that He has prepared for you. When you go, you can go with boldness. And you can go with confidence. There is no mission field so remote. There is no congregation so small. There is no community so obscure. There is no congregation so large that it lies in territory where our God does not reign. He reigns in all the earth. He is there on the banks of the river Kibar. So when he calls you and where he calls you, you can go. And when you get there, 
This is the God whom you are to show to the people entrusted to you. In the ministry, it's so easy for all of the minutia to crowd out the glory of the living, thrice holy God. You know, just this past week, perhaps you saw it, there was an article making the rounds online from a man leaving the pastorate because he was too overwhelmed by the pastoral care needs, the pressures, the demands, the opposition, even from those within. It was too much, and he was walking away. Now, all of the demands, all the pressures, even the opposition, they're real. They are there. But when you're enraptured with the glory of the one who sits on the sapphire throne, they fade into the background. They don't ultimately discourage. With your eyes on this one, you are freed and you are emboldened to serve. And seeing this one, you have something to give to the people entrusted to your care, the people whom you serve. Tell your people of this one. Tell your people of the one who sits enthroned above the firmament. Tell them of his radiance. Tell them that even when the world crowds their eyes, he's coming in judgment and he's coming with mercy. Stammer to speak into the mundane reality of a Tuesday afternoon the glories of the one whom Ezekiel saw and whom we see in the face of Jesus Christ. Show them the triune God in his infinite glory. Be so enraptured with him in such close communion with him that you bring the people into his presence. You be attentive to your character. Cultivate that as Paul instructed Timothy, take heed unto yourself. But most importantly, be enraptured and entranced with him, with the one who sits on the sapphire throne and who calls all of creation into judgment. It's when you're looking there, rather than when you're looking here, that you will be fed and transformed and that you will be as Moses, the Lord's own light traceable on your face. Now, at first, our passage this morning can seem a little confusion, confusing, but that confusion is the confusion of finite men trying to grasp the outer reaches of the outer glory of the infinite and eternal God. In our passage, it's as if words stagger and fall to their knees, inadequate to bear the weight of the glory that they're trying to express. But the glory of that vision is something we need to see. As ministers of the gospel, servants of this one, we need to see it. And we need to be prepared by it to tell it to others. Not instructions for how they are to live their lives, but a glimpse of the God who has made all things and who has redeemed his people. Our God is glorious beyond all describing. His glory fills the earth. He scours creation, bringing judgment to the wicked, showing mercy to his people. The inexpressibly glorious God of Israel is bringing judgment and showing mercy in all the earth. May we ever be among those people who are his, a people to whom he makes himself known, a people through whom he makes himself known to others, and a people upon whom he showers an eternity of mercy. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, we do give thee thanks this morning that thou art the God who hath revealed thyself, revealing thyself not only in such splendor to thy servant Ezekiel, but revealing thyself also unto us in thy word, by thy spirit. And Lord, forgive us that we allow the things of this world to distract us. 
that we become bound up in uh, the details of the flesh and we lose sight of thy thrice blessed glory. And we ask, O Lord, that thou wouldst be with us in the coming semester, uh, in all of the coming months of our lives, that thou wouldst show us more and more of thy glory and make us men who love thy word, who find thee in it, and to tell others of the glory of the God who is bringing judgment and who is showing mercy and who is doing so in every corner of the creation that he has created. And we ask, O Lord, for thy blessing uh, upon our labors. Make all of them, O Lord, pleasing in thy sight. Do it, we pray, for we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.